First, a word of welcome to those who may watch on the web and the uh, broadcast the, uh, that we put on the St. Dorothy Catholic Community website. This gospel always comes around this time of the year. Every time I read it, I remember the day in the seminary in 1965 when we had a summer session in, in a non-air-conditioned chapel in New Jersey. It was very hot and it was very humid. And we were, and the rector got up on Senior George Shea, and he gave a 45-minute homily. We were all dying as we sat there, but he kept talking and talking, and of course I don't remember a single word he said. I, I hope you might remember a single word I might say today. There's a television show called How Do They Do That? Maybe some of you have seen that. I know that. Joe likes to watch that show, and I'm sure you've seen it. So today, the title of my homily is, How Did He Do That? We heard a story, a story of Jesus being out in a deserted place and feeding many, many people, 5,000 men plus women and children that were not counted. This gospel was given to us by Matthew to remind us and tell us that the kingdom of heaven was here. Jesus was the Messiah who came. And Jesus met the basic needs that we all have, and that basic need is to eat. Now, we have no problem with eating, but if you've watched television this past week, you certainly may have seen and heard of the starvation in Somalia and the refugees that are, that are uh, traveling in order to be able to eat, walking on foot for many miles. And they eventually would get there and to the refugee camp, and then they have to still wait and go through processing. And meanwhile, the children are malnourished. Hopefully that many of them will eventually get fed with these little things. So this is something that, since we all need to eat, it's Matthew telling us the kingdom is here. And he even uses the illustration of 12 baskets were left over. In those days, numerology was important. In fact, some people still practice uh, numbers and their significance in their lives. He said there were 12. 12 was a sign of fulfillment that the kingdom was here. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 apostles. The number 12 was a significant one. There are other significant numbers in the scriptures, like 40, 40 years in the desert, 40 years of Jesus being tempted. So that's what the ultimate lesson of this gospel is. The kingdom is here among you. But there is more to this. And the more to this part of it, anyway, is the fact of how did Jesus feed these people? I'm sure that maybe you have wondered that yourself. And I'd like to give you two theories of how Jesus fed these people. And these theories have something that speaks to us today in our own day and age because of what's going on in Washington and the religious meaning behind what's going on in Washington. And if, when I say religious, many of you may stop and think and say, well, I must be talking about abortion or I must be talking about gay marriage or something like that. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this whole debt crisis that discussion going on in Washington. And whether we realize it or not, there is a deep religious meaning behind the process of what is going on. So the first theory is Jesus blessed the loaves and the fishes, and he passed the baskets, and as this person took their fish or their, and their loaf and handed it to the next, there was another fish and another loaf in there, and they took their fish and they took their loaf, and they had. We might say that Jesus was the great philanthropist, and he was showing us the beneficence of God, and God was taking care of his people. And when you took your fish, and your loaf, it was yours. And you didn't have to do anything more than eat it, and you didn't have to share it. You didn't have to do anything, it was yours. 
This is a philosophy that is Protestant in nature. This is a philosophy that is very strong behind the Tea Party, where we don't have to share and people should, there should be very little government, if any, so that if I want to share with you, I'll share with you, and if I don't want to share with you, I won't share with you. It's mine. The second theory is, Jesus took the fish and the loaves and he blessed them and he gave them and when people saw what Jesus did they took food that they had come with and they shared it with each other. And because of that people had enough to eat. This is Catholic social justice. This is Catholic, the Catholic way which is based on a community of persons who act as one on a local level where the central government meets the needs that the local level cannot meet. That basically is Catholic social justice. And isn't that what we find from the Democratic Party for the most part? Isn't that what we found in the 2008 election when everybody got upset about spread the wealth? That was a big thing back then, if you remember. Spreading the wealth is a Catholic thing. Not get ships spreading the wealth and not sharing is a Protestant thing that comes to us from down from Calvin and other Protestant thinkers from the past. And practiced and today by various Protestant groups, especially to the extreme, I focus on the family, the Family Research Council, the American Family Association. These are extreme Protestant groups. Some of them are labeled as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Conference. But this is what is going on in Washington. We have people who are motivated by what they believe that God wants them to do like Michelle Bachman, and we have other people who say, no, we need to do this other. This is important for us to realize that behind all of this is a religious belief. And our religious belief is what motivates us to do things in our lives. Even to that uh, saying, what would Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? Okay, when we ask that question of ourselves, we're saying, what is the motivation for me in my life? We are Catholics. If we're Catholics, is that not what we need to do? To share? This past week, I think it was, maybe it was the week before Pope Benedict, the President Pontiff, said that the basic problem in humanity is poverty. And he didn't then he went on to say, it's not poverty money, it's poverty of love. And if we love one another, we share with one another. We take care of one another. That's why the Catholic Church has traditionally supported such things as collective bargaining and unions. Okay, you see, when you think about what's going on in Wisconsin and in Washington, how these basic beliefs are behind there. And I think that we need to remind ourselves of what we believe in as Catholics so that we can encourage our legislators to do what we think Catholics should do. The media doesn't give much attention to this. The media focuses on the gay marriage problem, the abortions, and all that. And in fact, one time I criticized on our website Catholic bishops for not saying anything about the social justice issue, and I was wrong because then soon after that I read that there was a group of bishops who did speak out on this, but of course their comments wound up like that um, with comments playing in that paper. Okay, this is not something the media gives much attention to. As soon as an archbishop says, oh, abortion's wrong, no gay marriage, that's, that's, that's right on the front page of the paper. But the fact of taking care of the needs of each other is not on the front page. And to take and keep this process, I mean, the end goal is going to be the same. We want everybody to be 
said, I want everybody to be taken care of, whether or not you believe God's the great uh, philanthropist or you believe God wants us to share. The end is always going to be the same, but it's the process of getting there is going to make a big difference in people's lives. And it's making a big difference in people's lives these days. So I share those thoughts with you because we need to have that motivation in our lives to raise what we are going to do. And I hope we hear those words of Jesus and think about what we believe Jesus is asking us to do.